Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this lecture in context of the exhibition Pursuit of Abstraction, which we just opened uh, last week. It's my pleasure to introduce Christine Poole, our speaker today. Christine has served as artistic director at the Sun Valley Center for the Arts in Idaho since 1997, where she leads programming for the accredited museum, whose multidisciplinary approach involves exploring topics of relevancy through visual arts exhibitions, humanities lectures, and seminars, music, and theater performances. A curator and art historian, Poole also develops exhibitions, lectures, and writes on topics related to modernism, American craft, and contemporary art. Prior to joining the staff at the Sun Valley Center for the Arts, Poole worked as an independent lecturer, consultant, and art historian. Some of her previous experience includes director of Chicago International New Art Forms Exposition, curatorial assistant, Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, director of Little Street Gallery in Chicago. Kristen holds uh, a master's degree in modern art history from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's degree in studio art and English from Denison University in Ohio. Um, uh, Jerry Wolfson, lender to the exhibition, and Kristen have generously offered to lead a tour of the exhibition uh, as seen through their eyes this afternoon at 2.45. And uh, this is, go of course, is going to be a very interesting uh, way to explore the exhibition specifically from their vantage point. So I hope you can join us for that. If you'll please help me welcome uh, Kristen Paul. Good morning. This reminds me of going to um, graduate school and having to sit in an art history lecture first thing in the morning. So <laughs> if, you, if you all nod off, I, I'll forgive you. I probably actually won't even see you. So um, thank you again for whoever planned the beautiful sunset last night. Um, it was really welcoming. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here um, for so, so many reasons. Um, I need to give you a sort of um, full disclosure, and that is that I know intimately the works in Jerry Wolfson's collection. As many of you are aware, the exhibition that's up at the Baker is a compilation of Jerry Wolfson's collection and her uncle Mickey Wolfson's collection um, that are, is now at the Wolfsonian and FIU in Miami. And if you haven't been there, you must go tomorrow or the next day. It's an extraordinary and very, very unusual museum, and you're lucky to have it in your state, so I encourage you to get there. But I know Jerry's work, and um, I'm, it's been delightful for me to be able to scratch the surface of Mickey's collection. And it's clear um, that these two are related to each other. Um, they share DNA, uh, uh, not only um, blood DNA, but collecting DNA because they both collect in a very unusual way. They collect from their gut and their eye. And you say, well, doesn't everybody collect that way? And the fact of the matter is no. Very few people collect that way. Many of us collect by wanting and needing the sort of pieces of paper and the approval and provenance and history of artists. Jerry and Mickey don't go about the world that way. They go about looking at art from a place of curiosity and idea-based and content-based. And so the works in this collection are not a cohesive body of work. They're objects um, that each of these two people have collected based solely on the content of what they see in front of them. Um, it is a very unusual way to look at the world. It's um, what's resulted for both of them is, is really wonderful, very unique collections of art that are honest and true and come from a place of, um, they step into the world with, with curiosity, acute curiosity, and they ask lots and lots of questions. Um, as an art historian, this, this is fascinating but quite difficult <laughs> because it ends up that there are very few bits of paper. There's very little necessarily information on a number of artists in this exhibition. And as an art historian, we like bits of paper. We like resumes. We like to understand an artist's provenance. Um, history um, grounds us and validates us somehow. So um, it's been a journey to try to learn about a number of the pieces in the exhibition. In addition to that, one of the things that makes this exhibition unique is the curator of the exhibition is a man named Matthew Abess. Abyss? Abyss. Abyss. I knew I was going to get it wrong. Um, and Matthew 
is not an art historian. He is first and foremost a philosopher, a philosopher of ideas and a poet. And so he too has assembled a body of work um, that is the content of the exhibition that is based on the material in front of him. It's based on what he sees. He wanted to put together a show that, ex that really reflected um, an idea, the pursuit of abstraction that he wanted to base the objects on. So when you walk into most museum exhibitions, what you see generally is a body of work by an artist or a group of artists, and you get a breadth and depth of their exposure. This is an exhibition that's really based on pieces and pieces and pieces that I've put together to get to an idea. So as we consider works in the exhibition, um, the ideas that link it together are um, really about this period of time, a period of time in American history that actually was not that dissimilar to the moment we're in now, where we're living through, and they lived through, a surge in human invention that drastically changed the way that people were living, the way that they were working, the way they were communing with each other and with their gods. So modernism as an art historical moment is generally bracketed between the 1860s, 1880s, 1940s, 1950s, depending on who you talk to. For our purposes this morning, um, what we're going to do is look at most of the work that occurred in the latter half of that time period. And we need to sort of ground ourselves. Remember the late, later half of the 19th century was a period of enormous change. The, the Industrial Revolution was fully grounded. Things had been um, put in motion that would change the nature of the world. Um, the steam engine um, and the mechanization of machines enabled the distribution of goods in a much broader way than they had ever been distributed before. There was a profound society, societal shift from a rural agricult agricultural society to an industrial urban-based community. Really, really profoundly dif different. When people were moved from that agrarian society into the city, there was oftentimes um, a concentration of people in small areas. There were dirty, grueling working conditions. And people were alienated. They were out, distracted, taken out of their natural environment, taken out of um, nature, and they were uprooted and lonely. And then you add on top of that, we're going to get to the good part, um, the destruction and the death of the First World War. And that added to this sense of the world was not a world that anybody knew anymore. There was a collective sense across the Western world that traditional institutions had failed and failed deeply. The old ways of structuring and organizing society could no longer be trusted. Faith in the government, the church, established patri patriarchies, even rational law and the moral code was completely broken down by what happened with the World War. One of the works in the exhibition that illustrates this sort of despair and destruction, dislocation so profoundly is by a man named Oswald Pultelberger. It's a piece called Melancholy that he painted in 1928. Pultelberger is a German artist whose picture offers us a, a crowded room or a room full of people. And yet, if you look at it, you see no one is looking at each other. No one is connected. No one is touching. Pultelberger was interested in using his art to explore the idea of spiritual man isolated in this new age of uncertainty. He gives us a really static composition, incredibly sober concentrate coloration, and yet details in each of these person's faces. We know them. We see the specifics of who they are. But there's no clue to the actual space that they occupy. In his exhibition text, Matthew speaks about the distrust of reason that was present at this moment in history. Remember that for centuries, since the early Renaissance, there had been this assumption that civilization and participation in a civil society meant sort of a steady march towards a, mor a moral and just world. But the war had completely disapproved that assumption. And in fact, the idea had been completely exploded. So these new givens of an industrial, rational world 
were dislocating and disturbing. And for many, many, many people at this moment, um, there was a desire to find a new worth, a greater worth, worth beyond rational thought in the reality of day-to-day -day living. The war had, in fact, left a de destroyed landscape, but also a psychologically barren one, and I think that's the most important part for our purposes today. There was a void to be filled, a new hope to be found, and a search for new forms ensued that would form the backbone of what modernism and a new kind of art led to, which includes this sort of path to abstraction. So I show you two images um, of castles. Neither of these are in the exhibition, so I don't want to confuse you and have you off running looking for them. The one on the left is an image by Mary Swansea. Um, it's called uh, Skyscrapers, and it was done um, probably in the early 20s and 30s. The one on the right is a, it's an image that I sort of random, randomly plucked from the Wolfsonian's um, online collection. And I, and I show them to you intentionally because I want to give you a sense of where we were coming from, um, wh where we go to and where we come from. Um, the the book, book cover on the right is from the Wolfsonian's collection, and it gives you a sense of foreground, middle ground, and background. You understand there's a castle, you get the tree, you, you understand perspectival space. Not so true for the Mary Swansea on the left. Mary Swansea borrows from the modernist Cubist strategy of fragmenting form and combines it with the futurist approach of layering pattern to stimulate motion. More than likely, she made this painting sometime between 1940 and 1925 after she had digested European Cubism and before her style softened just a bit. I show you another pair to give you a sense of where we're going. On the left, again, the Swansea, and on the right, a British 19th century, late 19th century painting. So this exhibition explores this moment when we went from that to that, away from traditional structures that had guided art for so long. On the right, the veracity of the thing seen. So historically, at this moment, artists were, were, were touted for their ability to translate a three-dimensional thing into a two-dimensional surface. So that musculature was correct. The sky was correct. You understand what he's translating an object, an, a landscape scene out there. But change happened, and change is born from disillusionment and reconsideration. And for artists in the early part of the 20th century, that old rational form on the right was no longer resonant. It didn't work any longer. Artists and intellectuals began to dream of a world in which conflict and social inequality didn't exist, a world in which art could, could speak to our emotional and psychological truths where art could activate and illustrate these new truths, truths that were of a more spiritual and emotional nature. This searching for something more, the exploration of new forms, new ideas, and the return to life sort of celebrated the, the, the mysteries in our lives is the foundation for the exhibition and a huge part of the path to abstraction, how we get from one to the other. <clears throat> this is a painting entitled Voyaging that is in the exhibition um, by a woman named Agnes Pelton that she did in the early 1930s. It's illustrative of this move to the new form. There are flat planes of color, few shadows, no diminishing perspective here. This is not the record of a thing seen, okay? She wasn't out there looking out the beautiful Naples seascape. This came from her imagination. It suggests form rather than articulates it specifically. The bright color and light that Pelton employs is a major style in her work. Epitomizes the hopefulness and the energy that she and many, many artists at this time really embodied. So there was this dislocation, the, the despair, but there was also this, okay, let's move forward. Let's look for new forms. These artists believed that there were new paths to introduce society to new truths. And if... They, they, there was this sense of real energy and hopefulness. And if you don't get that, all you have to do is look at the color in that. Really, really drastically different. In 1931, the same year that Agnes Pelton painted this, she moved to California and began to investigate Eastern philosophies and thought. She found in them new possibilities that resonated with her longstanding interest in nature and her desire to use her art to articulate the divine 
This is not a small task for anyone. Her colorful canvases celebrate what makes up our natural existence, wind, stars. And this image isn't completely abstract, which we'll get to, but it's clearly not a realistic scene. It's a boat in a seascape, certainly. But there's a clear indication here that she wants this to be read as a metaphor. There's a bell and a chain in the upper corner. And it signals this symbolism. Like many, many artists of her age, Pelton explored ways that abstract pro properties of sound and motion could be conveyed through a static two-dimensional surface. In the exhibition, there's a poem that she wrote. Um, Pelton frequently accompanied written word with her painted form. Again, something that we'll see where they were trying to conflate ideas and sound and color and the written word to all combine in a visual image. But there's a poem you should read. I won't take the time to do it now. But in the poem, she talks about a change in approach, a change in a new way of thinking. And of course, this could be simply her move from the East Coast to California. That's significant change. Um, but I think it's also a poem about what she was aspiring to do and what artists at this time were aspiring to do, which was to create new ways of thinking. So while modernism was certainly a rejection of old standards, it was also an embrace of the new, newness in all of its possibilities. It was born of tremendous, tremendous hopefulness and a belief that design and art could transform society. But transformation was not going to come from manufactured industrialized goods. So in response to this manufacture, many of you all know this, the arts and crafts movements took root across the globe in, every, in almost every different Western society. There were different arts and crafts movements. In one form or the other, these various societies touted the need to return to handmade objects, to the artist's hand in some form or the other. They were born from this idea that art and design could not only make your life more beautiful, which is a really important point. It wasn't just about having lovely things around you that are handmade, but they believed that art and architecture could lead us to a new way of being, to a new way of thinking. Lots of the artists of the arts and crafts movement not only had this ideology as its groundwork, but also the sense that nature was a, was, a, was a place of restoration, that nature was a foundation from which this art could sort of grow up. And many of you know about Art Nouveau. This is a piece that was done in that Art Nouveau style that took its um, form from the leaves and the um, curves of, of, of natural form. This is a book page spread that was designed by Henry Vandeveld in 1908, so fairly early into the period of time that we're talking about. And interestingly, it was a book by Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche was um, hugely influential at this period of time, and Van de Velde was among the modernists who was, re who was keen on using art to advance social change. He absorbed Nietzsche's writings um, and the writings of many other philosophers at the time. And like others, he believed that art and design could be integrated and should be integrated into all aspects of society. So much so that when, even though he was an artist, um, he, like others, really thought that if you in created an environment where things were designed holistically, and this is a, um, a room that uh, Nietzsche's sister asked him to design at the Weimar um, in 1903, and Vandeveld designed every aspect of this room. So the curve of the wood, the fireplace, the arc of the windows, the sculpture, even for his own home, he articulated what his wife should wear. Um, so this idea of sort of comprehensive living was um, a big part of what many arts and crafts period people did. And Nietzsche was interesting for these guys, even though Nietzsche was not an anarchist and, and really believed that revolutionaries were foolish people, um, he was attractive to these guys because he rejected all the old values. There was this, he, he also disliked this idea of mass production, of mass mentality, and mass thinking. He was a distrustful of Christianity. And even his idea of the Ubermensch, a new kind of man, was attractive to people like Van der Velde the avant-garde of modernism really clung to Nietzsche. 
His writings and teachings also reinforced the cult of the individuality that would help fuel modernism's exploration of new forms. Really step back and keep in mind, we live in this age and time, but in the early 20th century, the idea of the individual and not the state or the church or your family or your community, but the individual was a fairly new idea. So Nietzsche's notion of existentialism reinforced the idea that the individual is alienated from a complex world. Other people like Sigmund Freud, of course, encouraged further investigation of the self. Freud's notion that um, both the conscious and the unconscious selves drive us and make our, our factors in our makeup was um, important to many of the painters and artists working at the time. This is a portrait by a man named Henry Bowman. Um, there are a couple of these in the exhibition. Bowman studied at the Kansas City Art Institute and the Art Students League of New York. This was a portrait that was done around 1940. Another one here, for those of you who are um, familiar with the American regionalism movement, you can sort of see the curves of American regionalism um, influenced here in Bowman's paintings. But for our purposes today, the fact that Bowman's painting the everyday man and woman, and neither of these people are looking up. Both of them are looking down, introspective, somewhat anxious. The lack of direct gaze, um, and the everyman appearance was a really important thing that happened, a shift that happened during this time period. This is no John Singer Sargent portrait of a society lady standing forward in all of her glory and patronage. These are everyday people. Another portrait in the exhibition is a wonderful painting by Elizabeth Catlett that she did in 1943. It's a remarkable painting of a woman at rest. She leans her head in her hand, completely exhausted. Notice the size of her hands. They're larger than her head. That's an indication that she labors with them, that that is the most important part of her body. The cubist squaring off of her blouse, her hat, in the background all illustrate how European modernist stylistic language made its way across the ocean and into American modernist um, skill base. Again, there's no setting here. We don't know where any three of these portraits are. We don't have a sense of, are they at home? Are they in the library? Are they at the kitchen table? Are they at work? And that's not important. What's important is the person and their gaze. Only here is the woman isolated and tired. Catelyn um, is a woman uh, who is widely celebrated for chronicling the African-American female experience in particular. Catelyn believed that her job was to convey social messages through her art. So most of her art focuses on subjects like this. And so while there, this sense of isolation was out there and present at this time, it's very interesting that there were a group of artists who were keyed into it and wanted to convey the plight of the individual at this moment in this new age of disillusionment. Simultaneously, many artists turned their attention to a renewed search for meaning. Not surprisingly, many artists turned to nature as a reaffirmation of life's mystery and as a source of divinity. This is a really great painting from the Wilsonian's collection by a man named Hans Frank, painted in 1927. This is how I feel in Idaho a lot of times. Um, you're overwhelmed by nature's majesty. I mean, he's literally bowled over by the beauty that he's confronted with. And in his hand is a crystal. The crystal is nature's pure form of balance and equanimity. There's truth embedded here. The image also speaks to the promise of youth, youth and health. And I was telling Jerry ahead of time that, interestingly, Frank was included in the German art exhibitions in Munich in 1938. Those were the art exhibitions that Hitler approved of. So you can bring lots of things to paintings as you read them. <clears throat> For our purposes, what's interesting here, besides the scene of nature's glory and wonder, is that this painting is painted very realistically. We get a sense of his musculature. We, there aren't, it's not reduced to small, flat planes of color. Um, we, we get a sense of foreground, middle ground, and background. But it's not a specific place. It's not a real moment. But 
Frank was interested in conveying an idea. Nature became a symbol for hope and power, even for God, force, energy. We see this theme of nature as source of energy and renew renewal addressed by several artists in the exhibition. This is a painting from Jerry's collection, Adele Watson. It's called Protection, and it was painted in 1920. There are two women naked in a stylized landscape. At first glance, it appears that they are in an embrace. And then as you look further, and it actually took Jerry and I a while to see this, they're the same woman. It's the same person, arms wide in openness, transformation, grace. And it's interesting that Watson's titled the piece Protection. So nature here becomes a source of comfort an affirmation of the truths that artists were looking for, an imaginary place of renewal and freedom. Like many artists of her time, Adele Watson was an idyllic thinker. Those of you who read and tucked under your bed the prophet, Cahil Gibran, she was a pal of his. Um, through her art, she wanted to articulate a reality beyond the everyday, beyond the mundane, one which transcended physical ex ex existence and had aspirations for something greater. Her own aspirations for spirituality and examination of spirituality led her to um, a lot of Eastern thinking as well. So we hear this pattern over and over again. Artists who grew up in the West looked East for inspiration at this time, because that Western stuff didn't work any longer. Over and over again in the exhibition, we see female forms that are used as symbols of unity, wholeness, and of course, fertility and growth. We were just looking at this. This is the most remarkable little tiny woodcut. Get your face in it when you go in that exhibition. It's a very small piece of art. That's why slideshows really don't, they're very deceptive. <laughs> but um, beautifully, beautifully rendered um, by a man named John Buckland Wright. It's called Girl into Fish, done in 1939. And here, the female form and nature become interchangeable. Um, many artists obviously did that and thought that. Um, here, he explores the uses the female form to explore this notion of change and transformation. He was a New Zealander um, who frequently used this idea of a woman in, and placed her in abstract backgrounds to address spirit and energy. Here you see the woman transforming into a fish. But interestingly, the, the background and the, and the woman is herself become kind of separate from each other. In the top left, you see the fin attached to her body. In the bottom right, it's dislocated and part of the background. So everything sort of gets merged and mucked up into one. This is sort of the beginning of this path to abstraction, where there are forms in here we get, but the background and the foreground and the woman and the space behind her all become conflated. Interestingly, um, this guy was a um, veteran of um, both world wars and was at Verdun as an ambulance driver in World War I and was completely overcome by the destruction that he witnessed. And so in between the wars, he knew the only way he was going to be able to stand upright was to um, renew his faith in art and art's power to, f to embed a message of energy and spirit. And so he went and he studied Greek sculpture and embraced this idea that human form represented harmony and spirit. Another remarkable, remarkable little tiny wood engraving in the exhibition is a woman named Kate Eleanor Lampert. It is done around the 1930s. Again, can you see the, can you see the woman on the left-hand side? There's a woman in a landscape but she becomes nearly imperceptible from the trees. Her body and the trunk are the same forms and the same lines. Beams of light penetrate her body and the surrounding light landscape. So light and nature become inspiration and renewal. I love the sort of device of the tree branches framing the image here, um, almost as, as if they were in embrace of the idea. So again, abstraction is creeping its way in. Um, you can barely discern the form here with all of the energy that's going on. This is a fantastic little painting by a woman named Mabel Alvarez called Silent Places. 
that she did in 1929. Again, a lone woman in a utopian landscape. She offers us a meditative dreamscape of her imagination. This is clearly not a real place. She was another artist who was searching for new forms and new approaches. Around 1918, Alvarez was introduced to Eastern mysticism and began to meditate on a regular basis, which she continued to do throughout her life. In 1924, she took a, a tour of Eastern um, places. She went to Persia, to India, and Tibet, and absorbed not just Eastern ideology, but also the ideas um, embedded in Eastern art. And then in 1920, she returned to California, and by then, the ideas of theosophy societies had made their way to Southern California, and she discovered the writings of a man named Will Levington Comfort, who ideas were rooted in theosophy. And if anybody asks me any questions about theosophy, I will not be able to answer them. Um, it is, it's, it's interesting, the, di the deeper I dig, the less, the more vague it becomes. Um, it, it's a very sort of nebulous, wonderful philosophy that grew up at this period of time and became very, very popular because it's based on both Western thought and Eastern thought. Um, and, 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 and basically, it's a kind of thought that explored the, the distinctions between the world of form and the formless world and encouraging believers to make visible their inner sensations and feelings. So again, this search for, let's get the heck out of this real experience and into our inner life. So this tendency and this belief that this was the, the way of the future um, fed this um, sort of march towards abstraction. Um, one of the tools that Alvarez uses in her tool, toolbox, and many other artists do too, is color. Um, and color becomes a way to translate um, em emotion. Um, these serene blues and greens surround this very peaceful, almost glowing, haloed figure. And then there's the fire of the red that is a really lovely balance. A singular female form is also the central image and dream of youth, where Alvarez employs color again as a mechanism to convey her message of peacefulness, these sort of soft greens and really muted light. This was probably Alvarez's most significant painting from this time period. It was done in 25. Um, and, and it's a fabulous painting because it gets at it's an, it's an articulation of, these, of this moment where there were Eastern philosophies and Western philosophies, Eastern religion imagery, Christian religious Im imagery, and then sort of almost Greek um, classical ideology embedded in here. This painting can be read in multiple, multiple ways. Jerry will read it one way. I traditionally read, read it another. Um, but this dualism present um, is exactly um, what many artists sort of articulated over and over and over again. This is an Arcadian, almost Edenic landscape. It's filled with symbolic forms. There's doves and lotus flowers. They hold equal weight. There's arrows up on the top. The doves could be read as bodhisattvas, or they could be Christian doves of peace. She stands as the trunk. Many believe it's Alvarez herself. Under the tree of enlightenment, she has a halo. The tree of enlightenment has lotus flowers, where it's a symbol in Buddhism for enlightenment. And then there's these vignettes around the central figure that could simply be read as the sort of path to maturation. So you have dancing playful girls and music, you have coupling, you have family, and then you have spirituality. It also can be read as a path to enlightenment in either Western or Eastern thought. If nothing else, it's a, it's a, a remarkable image of peace. And it can be read as Alvarez's utopian vision, where we are connected to self, to nature, and to spirit. So there's a shared sense among artists of all disciplines at this time that there were new unexplored paths, many different ways to get to enlightenment or knowledge. And as Matthew pointed out in his text, and the, and the way that the exhibition is sort of laid out, Art was seen both as a manifestation of spiritual energy. So the artist, him or herself, creating something out of spiritual energy and a desire to emote, as well as a belief that the art could help us all onto a path of enlightenment and unification. We live in an age of uh, 
Maybe we're past irony, but we're sort of in disbelief. Um, but I, I can't emphasize enough that there was a belief at this moment that art could change the world. And artists believed that deeply. And it's really critical to understanding how, how they took this very, very seriously. For artists themselves, there was hope that what they imagined could manifest change in the world. And that offering alternative paths, new ways of making art, new ways of translating content, would help shift the future of the world. So this is an image called by Mishi Hashimoto, a woman, a young woman, um, who, she was young at the time when she did this, called Night in Mourning. And it's from a book, again, shows this desire on the artist's part to imagine new lands and idyllic landscapes. Um, this was the, the book um, that it's in, but it was by a man named Lord Duskeny, um, who was apparently a writer who had significant reputation at the time. He published more than 80 books. Almost all of them were in the fantasy genre and about invented lands. I think it's a really wonderful detailed drawing, again, that enforces this notion that many artists were looking east. We see the lotus blossom again, a symbol of purity. And I love the reflection. It, the scale is quite amazing of the, the drawing of the reflection of the woman looking down into the pools. Another artist who explored the possibility of new worlds is a man named Wenzel Hablick who created a portfolio of drawings in 1942. Um, I, I believe there's six of them in the exhibition. Um, I'm only going to talk about two here. Um, and that portfolio was called Creative Forces. And it offered a visionary concept of a crystalline landscape where rock formations are sculpted on a bed of clouds. He wrote that most of his work evolved from a series of personal events and claimed that when he was six, I think we all have had this experience when we were six. Um, he found a crystal specimen, and in it he saw magic castles and mountains, and he stuck with this the rest of his life. Um, he had this experience and then did a lot of reading of Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, and those sort of laid the foundations for his pursuit of utopian landscapes. Interestingly, he was trained by his father as a furniture maker, but studied architecture and interior design in school. And again, if we saw an artist, you can't read that very clearly. Can you see the faces in the middle ground there? If, if we saw an artist who was doing nothing but these sort of utopian landscapes now, we would say, great, graphic, design, graphic novel person, right? But this was very serious business, creating utopians. And so much so that Walter Gropius applauded Hablick for his utopian landscape designs. So there was this very, very collective, serious approach to imagine new worlds. Not that they were going to realize this, but that in thinking it, there could be transformation. So Hablick and Alvarez can in some ways be viewed as quintessential early modernists who, in keeping with their age and time, were seekers not only in their art, but in their lives as well. Their artwork reflected a better hope that, could, that the world could be pursuing and, 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 and looking for. And then there were people like Arthur Schopenhauer, who was writing at the time. And he was among the first of his age to contend that at its core, the universe is not a rational place. This is not surprising to many of us. Um, Schopenhauer developed a complicated philosophy, but basically uh, his philosophy was in the face of endless strife. We ought to minimize our natural desires and develop a more tranquil frame of mind, basically a kind of give in and give up ideology, not the most positive of thinkers, but nevertheless an important one um, who reflected an angst that was really present at the time. And we see a number of artists in the exhibition um, that have this sense of conflict. Um, there's, there's ideology of old, old ideology, old traditions. There's ideology of new traditions. And, and trying to reconcile these things together was really um, was difficult. And Matthew did a fantastic job of pulling those out of the, of the number of objects in the, in the exhibition. This is a painting, painting of the Fowler, done in 1930-33 by a woman named Gladys Hines. And it's a really confounding image, because you have the three graces. They're perhaps 
offering a blessing, but they don't seem to be terrifically engaged. And an imaginary seascape, this again is not a real place. And then there's a man who has recently captured his birds and is pulling taut the net. The reference, um, biblical reference to a fowler is from the book of Psalms and goes, surely God shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. So biblically, that's a message of freedom, right? Through God, you're set free. And yet, this is not an image of freedom, at least I don't read it as such. So this p- painting appears to sort of offer a moral, but its message is completely and totally ambiguous. It, and it's, it's an indication of the ambivalence that was present at this moment. Artists were questioning what tradition is, what tradition is valid, what stories can we hold on to, and what should we let go of? In Grover Cole's image, Two Men in a Landscape, done in 1938 and 1940, we see this sort of ambiguity somewhat resolved. It's a really wonderful image, an older man and a younger man. And the younger man's pressed forward in the foreground, almost as if he's about to leave the picture plane. The older man is looking at him, hopeful, somewhat resigned. There's an acceptance here of transition of a new day, a new day coming, a new dawn arising. But then it's in this very weird, orange, surreal background with a completely denuded tree. Well, the good news is this young man is walking away from that. So is he escaping? It's unclear. Please note the difference in um, clothing. Really, really fascinating. Um, The older man in traditional coat and tie and the younger man in some sort of new age, fantastic metal suit. So a new age dawning. Interestingly, this picture was shown in the Golden Gate International Exhibition in 39, obviously an image projecting the future. Other other worldly images that demonstrate artists' desire to explore landscapes outside of reality are presented by two paintings um, from Jerry Wolfson's collection. These are a woman by a woman named Helen Lundenberg. This is called Fantasy. It was painted in the late 1940s. These works come out of the tradition of surrealism. And remember, surrealism was where artists juxtaposed unlike images in fantastic settings to explore the sort of dreamlike or unconscious state, so a new reality. But Lundenberg did not really subscribe um, to the randomness and the disorderly structure of the surrealist, but embraced the sort of liberation in that ideology, and she and her husband called themselves post-surrealists. These images are whole compositions, so they're not the René Magritte sort of dissemblage of objects, but whole compositions to be read as landscapes. But there are no no landscapes that I have ever seen. They are a moonlight place where rocks and shadows loom large and the tree is leafless. This image reminds me of that Close Encounters of the Third Kind where that rock looms up and you're supposed to pay homage. That tree just looks terrified in in the light of that shadow of the rock. Um, These landscapes are without human inhabitants. They're alien and mysterious. Again, we see not straight realism, but a desire to use the tools of realism, so accurate perspectival painting. There's actually a foreground, a middle ground, and a background here, and shadows. Um, but it's, to, it's used to explore this sort of new imagined landscape and to explore emotions and states of mind, new and important states of mind that the surrealists were also exploring. This is a small wood engraving in the exhibition um, by Lind Ward, um, and it was done for a book from 1932, importantly titled, Now That the Gods Are Dead. So again, this transition. The old form wasn't working. And it's it's actually an incredibly hopeful image. Man's triumph in the face of a ruinous post-war landscape Notice these sort of broken columns, the classic columns in the foreground. The old form is down, but man will ascend and is illuminated by rays of light, reborn and strong. So we've seen repeatedly this impulse at the moment was to find a new language and a way to pick the intangibles of life. 
the emotional states that we live in, our sources of inspiration and energy. Attempting to show energy in metaphysical form became the work of a number of artists that Matthew put together um, who are seeking explanations beyond science to affirm the mystery that we all have together. This is a, the front piece of the exhibition and the, and the entry piece that you see um, appropriately. Um, it's uh, by a man named Sex, Sexto Canigallo, and it's entitled Social Energy, and it was done in the 1920s. Canigallo's image suggests our desire for harmony can be found in the combined force of mind, body, and spirit. On the left is a man holding his head in his or chin in his hand, thinking, thinking man. On the right, a man proud, standing on his feet in his body, his physical body. And in the center is a woman, the female form under a star of light as the fertile energy and the source of balance in the middle. This is a really radical painting for 1920. Um, this oval geometry of form is an introduction in form that is new. The rays of light that are used to talk about energy and that are sort of generating through the painting that create some movement in the painting. This is familiar to us now. This was not familiar in the 1920s. These people aren't situated anywhere real. They're not even on a real plane together. So it's not a realistic scene. It's a, it's a total abstraction and an attempt to show energy and transformation. These were really radically new ideas. He also uses color, as do a lot of uh, the artists in the exhibition, to sort of give us this sense of pulsating light, going from dark to light and energy in the middle. Another artist who uses similar styles of movement and energy and color is a man named Vincento Bono, who um, did a whole series of letterpress print, prints in the exhibition. These series of images have titles that link them both to Christian and to Buddhist traditions. This is Om Mani Parahum, which is obviously an Eastern way of yoga, yoga, yogatic, yogatic breath. I don't know how you say that. Breath with yoga. Um, and this is a piece called Divine Breath. Obviously, these are aligned with Eastern meditative traditions. The divine breath sort of swirls out there. Lines are used to portray motion of light and air. This is called the way of the cross and portal of initiation, Christian language. But there's no obvious Christian imagery in here. There's actually no cross in there sort of suggestion of one, but not entirely a cross. Again, this crossover exploration, not entirely symbols of one faith, but a willingness to explore opportunities picked from each of these traditions. The triangle is a shape that we see we, that Vince Bono uses over and over again. And the triangle is one of those shapes, like a circle, that is used across traditions. And it's a central motif in each of these pictures. It's a sign of the balance that we're seeking and talking about in this exhibition, oops, sorry, um, of mind, body, and spirit, and also signals aspiration and resurgence. I suspect if I had just shown you those images, you all would get that there was some um, religious iconography embedded here. We just sort of instinctively understand that. So the desire to find new forms was the foundational tenet of modernism. Realism was perceived as bound up in the rationalization that had created the despair of the war. The move to total, to total abstraction was propelled by so many things. And if you guys want to stay here a really long time today, we can talk about all those things. But um, one of the things that um, was a propulsion to abstraction was the desire to be honest about structure and form fueled in part by the arts and crafts ideology that form should follow function, artists explored how to break objects apart into geometric elements and reduce things down to their simplest form. This idea of reduction began, of course, with the cubists and took lots of different paths. Um, in, in, for this image, this is a woman um, uh, designer by, named Ilsa Failing, and this is a maquette drawing that she did um, for a marionette, a marionette play, play um, where the human form is translated through basic geometric shapes. I think you guys can see head, torso, and legs here in these forms. 
Failing believed that reducing things to their simplest state was a way to create harmony between the physical and the psychological realms, this desire to find a place that would articulate both of those things. She did these while she was enrolled in the Bauhaus and was asked to design um, marionette puppets um, for a play that was happening there. This notion that simplicity of form and abstraction would unite us um, is an interesting notion and something that modernism was founded on. But at first, it seems enormously contradictory. For many of us, including myself, abstraction makes interpretation vaguer, not easier. But artists believed at the time, by reducing things down to their simplest forms, flat planes, that it would be easier to represent abstract thoughts and feelings. So to literally get away from the thing seen to things that aren't seen. Simplified form was a counterpoint to reality and part of the path to a more harmonious view of the universe and that language of abstraction that would unite us. This is a painting um, by a woman named Virginia Beresford and we see simplification and reduction in action here. While these, this image and this image are not, this is a painting called Granary, while these are not entirely abstracted images, they are far from traditional landscapes. They are suggestions rather than depictions, evoking sensations and perhaps some mystery instead of clearly depicting a thing seen. As was the case for many artists of the time, Beresford experimented with a whole variety of styles and approaches in her work in her lifetime. The shell work um, shows the influence of magic realism, an offshoot of surrealism, which actually came to the United States after the war. Um, René de Magritte and Roy de Quirico came to the United States, fled Europe, um, and this idea of magic realism and, and creating paintings that were not based in dream imagery of the surrealist, but on a kind of distorted realism um, took root, um, and you would transform ordinary landscapes into, into fantastic scenes. In this painting, um, a curtain of shells sort of unfolds and opens up into a seascape. There are flat, dense sections of color, and again, very simple forms. Those of you who are familiar with um, the paintings of Arthur Dove or Georgia O'Keeffe, this becomes a language of American modernism that, that permeated for a long period of time. And I love the granary, being a Midwestern girl this sort of enormous giant breast emerging out of the flat plains of the American Midwest. It's simple, it's bold, it's aspirational, the sort of spiral upward. Another American modernist that used simple geometric forms is Ida O'Keeffe. This is a series of paintings on lighthouses that she did called the Highland Lighthouse Series. And in it we see the motion of light captured in these sort of dense, triangles and ribbons of color. This calls to mind uh, um, a theory that many uh, painters embraced at the time called dynamic symmetry, uh, which was an influential concept that linked art and mathematics. Um, and it was a way to try to get artists to translate motion through form um, and took its um, roots from organic patternings found in nature. Um, there's so these sort of implied motion. Um, I love the arc that goes around the far side of the lighthouse and that ends up on the roof. Really, really smart way of thinking about how to, how to convey motion and light. Another lighthouse by Ida O'Keefe. Ida O'Keefe's story is another story, but an interesting one. She is, in fact, the sister of Georgia. Another extraordinary painter in Jerry's collection is an Irish woman that we talked about at the beginning, um, and Mary Swansea, whose work we saw early on in the, in the talk. Um, this image is called Propellers, and we see similar abstract strategies at work here. The perspective of this painting is really quite marvelous. The we're down in the sea, where the propellers are coming towards us, or actually going away from us. Dynamic color, flat geometric shapes, and yet the crossing of those geometric shapes gives us a sense of motion. Many modernists approached abstraction and the quest for spiritual resonance through their use of color. We saw that in Mabel Alvarez and in Agnes Pelton's painting Voyaging. Some artists even went so far as to believe that colors had their own distinct relationship to sound. 
The idea that color could convey sound fitted with the spirit of this age. When artists were realizing, were seeking ways to realize new synthetic experiences where art and the material distinctions between word, image, sound would kind of melt away in a, in a sort of spiritual abstraction aha moment that all of these elements could come together. This image um, is by a woman named Dorothy Brett. It's called Stowowski Symphony, 1934. And in it, she attempts to convey through color and light the idea of a musical experience, which would be an ambitious project for anyone, but was particularly ambitious for Brett because she was deaf. And so the only opportunity that she had to understand music was through her imagination. Strawowski was a British conductor who had a long, long, long association with the Philadelphia Orchestra, but Brett met him in Taos, New Mexico. Taos, New Mexico becomes this place very similar to um, um, Stein and Toklas's place in Paris, a salon, a woman named Mabel du Dodge Luhan, um, sort of collected artists and thinkers, people like D.H. Lawrence and O'Keefe and Stieglitz and Dorothy Brett spent time um, in, in, in New Mexico, and it was there that she met Stowalski and ended up following him back east and doing a whole series of 11 paintings chronicling the way she imagined a symphony would sound. This image is, um, I, I surprisingly ended up landing on it um, because she, it, it's, it's not a very good painting, but, but and, it, and she's not a very well-known artist, but it's, capt it's captivating me because I think it embodies the hope felt by so many artists of this time. This desire to push past and through reality and find a better way to express our better selves and our shared divinity with this sort of naive and hugely wonderful assumption that art could help us be better people. This belief that not only content, but the form of a painting could propel a shift in our state of mind and release a common shared emotional resonance was really the foundation of modernism. And when you think about it, it worked. It wasn't that far-fetched. Many of you are familiar with the work of Franz Klein and Jackson Pollock, okay? Pure abstractionists, huge arcs of black and white, and Pollock swirls. These are completely abstract paintings. And you think, what the heck were they thinking? They were emoting onto the canvas and they were big machismo guys, and they were talking about themselves, and they were talking about America in the 1950s, and they were talking about the atom bomb. That sort of chaos comes through in those abstractions. This painting to me, when you think about a symphony, and you think about music, and you're in a great musical experience, and music sort of absorbs the room, and it sends you, that's what she's captured here. And it's really quite remarkable. So I like her. Um, they had something, these modernists. In releasing themselves of the restricted forms of the past, they opened themselves up and their audience to the possibility of shared psychological and emotional and spiritual states. So I want to end where I began, with a woman named Agnes Pelton, who I think is the artist in Jerry's collection who, for most, who most clearly resonates with the theme and the content of Matthew Abbas' proposition in this exhibition. For Agnes Pelton, the pursuit of abstraction meant the freedom to explore forms that would unleash and illustrate the positive force that she believed was at work in nature and in the universe. Interestingly, I didn't realize this until I started to write, she was an artist whose life was actually bracketed by modernism. She was born in 1881 and she died in 1961, so she lived the experience. She was traditionally trained and actually earned her living almost all of her life by painting realistic portraits. But like so many others of her time, she was compelled to use her art as a mechanism for exploring other realities and more complicated truths of our human experience. This is a painting from the Wilsonian's collection that she did fairly early on in her life. She did it in 1917, and it's called Room Decoration with Purple and Gray. It was done for a parlor in Washington, D.C. There's a classic Madonna, central female form again. But it's around the edges, 
where we see Pelton's abstract images begin to impulses begin to emerge. There's clearly, this is not a specific place, but an imaginary one where the fe female figure is framed by curves, curving planes of light and by luminous flowers. The dark curtains that she uses around the edge is something, a device that she uses often to get you into the painting and into the energy. It was a few years later in the American Southwest that Pelton found her spiritual and artistic maturity. In keeping with others of her time, um, she was interested about Eastern, in teachings of Eastern religions, and for a time she studied theosophy, as well as other meldings of Eastern and Western thought. So she moved from those semi-realistic romantic images to pure abstractions, and this was born of her desire to create pictures that reflected the energy of nature that she found in the American Southwest. It's called Radiance, and it was done in 1929. It's a hugely, I mean, this is a complete, we're now at complete and total abstraction. It speaks to movement and flames, to water and light, she uses light as a metaphor for inner contentment and the positive energy that she wanted to see reflected in the world, and she used her art to reflect it. Nearly always the most luminous areas are in the center. She's pulling us in. So we sort of completed this arc from pure realism to abstraction. And for artists of the early part of the 20th century, in the rejection of reality, in the use of new forms, in color, flat planes of shapes, light, being able to translate energy. There was a possibility, they believed, for artists to share and interpret new ideas. All of it born from an aspiration to find a common form that would expose our shared humanity and life's divinity and led to this pursuit of abstraction. Thank you.